Do you know which was the first non-Western and the only communist-ruled country in the Eurovision Song Contest? Yes, you're right. It was Yugoslavia. The state, which no longer exists, got to participate 27 times before it fell apart. This video will be a reminder of their Eurovision successes and failures. Besides, this is also a story about the people who used to hum these songs before the wars scattered them all across the globe. So don't change the channel and join me on this journey to revive some long-forgotten melodies. Yugoslavia's debut was in 1961. As you'll be able to notice yourselves, the most of the songs from the early period were typical schlagers, trying to reflect the country's socialist modesty. Even the brooch that you see had to be added secretly onto the dress of Liljana Petrovic, Yugoslavia's first entrant. Only a year later, Lola Novakovic gave the country its first success, finishing fourth. The irony was that Yugoslavia would have to wait for 21 years to repeat that result. In 1966, Yugoslavia actually had two participants. One was Berta Ambroš, and the other one was Teresa Kesovia, who represented Monaco. Ironically, she scored zero points. Not even the Yugoslav jury awarded her with any. The 1968 contest was the first Eurovision that was broadcast in color. Yugoslavia was represented by its first upbeat song, which finished seventh. The performers were the popular troubadours of Dubrovnik in their Renaissance-style outfits. Despite their relative success, Yugoslavia decided to stick to typical schlagers in the following years. Good morning. 
Саня, твой деча не душа. In 1972, Teresa Kesovia returned to Eurovision, this time to represent her own country. The nation's expectations were high, but eventually she managed to reach only the ninth place. Many would agree that the Yugoslav entry for 1975, the song called A Day of Love, was the most beautiful song that Yugoslavia sent to Eurovision. Due to many covers, even teenagers in Slovenia still know it by heart. It's no miracle that the nation's expectations were high, so the 13th place was like a punch in the face to the Yugoslav national broadcaster. The result in 1976 was the final step towards giving up completely. Having finished last after the voting and 17th after the correction, the broadcaster decided it was time to withdraw from the contest. Their decision would remain for five years. During the Yugoslav Eurovision break, the national broadcaster received lots of requests to reverse their decision, as the contest was very popular in the country. Eventually, they acquiesced in, and after the five-year absence, Yugoslavia returned to the contest. This is Lepa Brena, the most popular Yugoslav pop folk singer of the 80s. In 1983, her song about making out in a nature also competed for Eurovision, having finished seventh at the Yugoslav pre-selection. In those days, many people were convinced that she should have been the one to represent the country. However, that was before Daniel stepped onto the Eurovision stage and finished fourth. The song about his summer love named Julie was just irresistible to European juries. Yugoslavia was simply delighted. <laughs> Go 
Ona se zvijeza sa neba Spustila meni na tlan Znao sam samo o njoj Da zove se Juli The song's success didn't end at Eurovision, as Daniel's record was sold in about 800,000 copies across Europe. From that period, the broadcaster also started to invest in Eurovision videos more, having realized those were a great promotion of the country's tourism. The video of the 1984 entry even caused a scandal in Turkey. Because of the scene you're just watching with a girl in topless, the Turkish national TV refused to broadcast the Yugoslav video while presenting the participants. Who would say that Yugoslavs were that liberal back then? However, without nudity, Isolda and Vlado didn't attract so much attention. They finished 18th. And if you happen to wonder why the Yugoslav singer Isolda Barugia seems too familiar, that's because she performed on Eurovision stage three times in a row. In 84 as a singer, in 83 as a part of this unforgettable dance, and a year earlier as a member of ASCA. Now, don't get scared! This program wasn't suddenly hacked by some communist hackers. The reason why Tito is here is because Yugoslavia decided to skip Eurovision in 1985, as it was taking place on the fifth anniversary of Tito's death. <laughs> In 1986, Lepa Brena applied to Yugovizia again. She finished 10th, having lost to Doris Dragovic. If Doris seems somehow familiar, maybe you can recognize her from the future! She would return to Eurovision 13 years later to represent Croatia with the song Maria Magdalena. In 1987, the famous Croatian songwriter Rajko Dujmić started his three-year Eurovision row, composing catchy pop songs which would appeal to the taste of European juries. Rajko's first appearance was with his own band, Novi Fossili, who finished fourth. The lyrics were slightly flirting with English, as that was the time when everyone had to sing in their mother tongue. Raiko would use a similar recipe two years later, which would turn into an even greater surprise. Riva brought the only Eurovision victory to Yugoslavia. The nation was overjoyed and, as a result, 
the next year's contest arrived in Zagreb. And welcome our two presenters, Helga Vlahovic and Oliver Vlakar. Poštovni gledalci, dobra večer. Dobra večer i dobro nam došli u Zagreb. Bonsoir a tous, bienvenue a Zagreb. Yugoslavia was represented by Taichi, a young singer from Zagreb, who would turn out to be the country's last teenage pop star. Quite ironically, while Eurovision was singing about United Europe, Yugoslavia began to disintegrate. The 1991 Yugoslav pre-selection was scheduled for the 9th of March. On the same day, a big riot took place in Belgrade, resulting in tanks and armored cars in the streets. Despite the dramatic events, the Eurovision show went on. Yugovizia 1991 was the last one with all republics participating. It was held in Bosnia, the most diverse among the six republics. The host city was Sarajevo, which would soon become a place of a devastating siege. The war would also displace Bosnian singer Zerina Tsokoya, whose love song finished fourth that evening. Her life would soon continue in Germany. The main rivals at Yugovizia were Daniel, supported by the Croatian television, and Bebidol, supported by the three TV centers from Serbia. After a highly political voting, Bebidol turned out to be the winner as three Serbian juries basically outvoted the others. Expectedly, both the Belgrade and the Zagreb jury gave zero points to their rivals. Anyway, Daniel's big Eurovision comeback fell through and Babidol soon departed to Rome. Despite her new outfit and a new arrangement, she scored only one point. Apparently, she was too extravagant for European juries. Her performance was obviously ahead of its time, and she would have probably gained more points in the era of televoting. <laughs> Without the red star on the flag, and without Slovenia and Croatia at the pre-selection, Yugoslavia got to send one last song to Eurovision. It was an emotional song about regretting an old love while waiting for the dawn. The performer was a Serbian singer Extra Nena. After her performance, Serbia would have to wait for 12 years to become a member of the Eurovision family again. To Yugoslavia, the party was over. It was time to take a bow. <laughs>